Connectra creates opportunities for people living with disabilities by providing information, resources, and programming geared towards greater inclusion and quality of life. Check out some of the programs we offer through our online learning platform, Connect Together, including our Service Mondays, where we highlight a local organization or initiative. Wednesday Chair Yoga with Bobby Seal Kobiski. Thursday Adapted Fitness with Megan Williamson. Friday Rotating Dance Classes hosted by Janice Lawrence and Joanne Cuff and other initiatives, including presentations by the Disabled Independent Gardeners Association's Growable Program and our Perspective Series. Check out our updated programs calendar on our website, connectra.org, or find us on Facebook at Connectra Society. Okay, Emily, you can start. Thank you so much for being here. Someone just emailed me with the link to asking for the link to join. So I'm just firing that off to them right now. Um, my name is Emily and I am your Connectra program coordinator. And I love the perspective series are some of my favorite programming that we do here because it's a really great way to actually connect and engage with people in our community and uh, just have like a really open, honest conversation. So I have some uh, sort of questions that we've gathered off the top, but as things come up, if you want to comment on each other's perspectives, uh, we just want this to be sort of a free flowing organic conversation where we feel like we can get to the root of what we're talking about today, which is navigating mental health with a disability. So I just want to welcome everybody that is watching online. Uh, now we're in the future, and if you require closed captioning, please make sure to enable the closed captions in Zoom. We have an otter transcript available for people watching on YouTube and Facebook, and attendees are free to ask questions if they join. Um, and I would like to start with our panelists introducing yourselves, if that's all right. I think that's just kind of a nicer way to do it. So if we can start with Kate, could you introduce yourself and how you relate to the world of mental health and disability? Sure, um, so my name is Kate. Um, I use they or she pronouns. Um, I am a disabled queer person, uh, activist, artist, and educator, and also mental health counselor. Um, so if you met me in person, you would see that I was disabled because I use a walker or I use a wheelchair, a power wheelchair, depending on how I'm feeling. Um, I've, uh, been disabled since I was a kid and, um, have a progressive chronic health, uh, condition. Um, I started, um, working in the social service sector when I was quite a bit younger. Um, and now, um, I've been, uh, I've had my own private practice, uh, for three years now, and I support, queer and trans, uh, disabled and chronically ill folks with uh, their mental health using kind of a variety of different modalities, but a lot of my work uh, is based in disability affirming therapy. So the idea that uh, having a disability is a culture into itself. And so, um, so what I provide is, you know, unique in the sense that I get to connect with my clients because we both have disabilities or chronic illnesses. Um, and I've also started doing couples counseling where I support couples uh, who are disabled or mixed ability uh, with their um, conflicting access needs, basically. And I also, uh, so I do that mental health work. Um, and then at the same time, so the mental health work is like interpersonal and we also work on internalized uh, ableism. Um, and then I also teach workshops. Um, I work at the Center for Independent Living in Toronto and uh, we are teaching anti-ableism workshops. So a type of anti-oppression workshop focusing on disability so that we can start to combat uh, ableism within society because we know that ableism is 
you know, the main issue with uh, navigating mental health as, as a disabled person. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. And I have a website if anyone's interested. Um, if anyone's watching this later, it's Kate Welsh, W E L S H dot C A. And I am really glad to connect with folks. So, yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. I will post that in the chat. I'll get that website up as well. Thanks so much for sharing, Kate. And I'll pass it off to Mary Lou. Could you introduce yourself? Hi. Uh, yes. Thank you, Emily, for the invitation. Uh, this is my second invitation from Connectra uh, to talk to the community and gladly accepted the invitation. Um, I'm uh, Marie Lou Marshall, I'm one of the Bounce Back Coach for the Canadian Mental Health Association and the Vancouver Fraser branch. And I've been with the Bounce Back um, for a bit more than five years and a program directed, um, a CBT-based, cognitive behavioral-based program directed to people that have mild to moderate symptoms of depression and anxiety, so which pertain to all of us, right? Um, so uh, we work um, closely with participants in one-to-one -one sessions, uh, four to six sessions, and it's completely free for any BC residents. Um, so just get in contact with your doctor, or you can also do a self-referral. Anyway, we, we can discuss that afterwards, but I just want to say very quickly that I'm glad to be here, and I wait for your questions at the end of it. Awesome. Thank you. That's good to know. Yes, we will talk about how somebody can do a self-referral and your free services in a bit, for sure. And Ryan, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself. Let's just make sure I'm muted. Oh. Hi, my name is Ryan Yolis. I'm a, a therapeutic counselor at Island Community Counseling here on Vancouver Island, and I specialize in physical illness counseling and physical health condition counseling. And I also specialize in disability justice, and I engage in disability activism whenever possible. So it's like how I came to the, this, why well, I always wanted to get in the field of mental health based on our, my struggle as growing up with a, a progressive health condition. So I decided I'm going to counsel to help other families like mine not struggle alone. And it's been a real sense of passion and pride for me to help people navigate through the, their, their mental health and empower my clients with disabilities to fight for their rights and stand up for themselves and empower them has been really an amazing thing to witness. And probably I found that the mental health field has not been so accommodating for people with disabilities because of the ableism, as Kate Walsh kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. I found it really difficult for myself to find a counselor. So I'm hoping that's going to change through conversations like this that we're having today. Because there's many counselors and feel that mental health is not accommodating and there's so much ableism in it still, which I hope to combat and change through my education, the education to educate my school before and my practicum that I'm at right now through my presentation about disability justice counseling and how it is relevant to the field of mental health. Fantastic. Thank you so much, all of you, for the work that you do and for taking the time to be here. For those of you that just joined, if you have any questions, uh, you can post them in the chat or you should have the ability to unmute yourself. But if you don't, you could uh, raise a hand uh, with the raise hand function in Zoom or just raise your hand. I can see you. So uh, I will start it off. I just want to quickly define the difference. Mary Lou, if you could, between a social worker and a counselor. Interesting, because I'm also a social worker. <laughs> but my well, role, I had you written down as a social worker, yeah. My role, my role as, a, as a coach is not in, in the social work, so it's different. And, and, and the role as a coach is also very different from a counselor or therapist, right? So we might have intertwined in, in, in certain aspects of it. 
right? A, a counselor and a therapist will, will dig more deeper into issues that might be pertaining to the current issues that the, the participant or client or patient is facing. Um, as a coach, we work uh, in a collaborative way with the participants and meet them where they are, believing that their recovery, um, they want to make things better. They want to recover. They want to move forward. They want to bounce back from what they, they were facing. So we work into what the CBT uh, approach is, uh, creating plans, right? So the participant, we empower the participants that they, they make their choice. They choose their, their workbooks. We have 20 workbooks and they, they work uh, at home and they see what tools from the materials are applicable for them and create a strategies. And we set plans, constantly setting plans. And with, when you see through the sessions, when we debrief their work, how they're moving forward because they 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 come to the program because they they know that the way he been trying did not pay off or did not work. They, there's never late to set new patterns, new ways, new reframing of things. So the counselor were explored deeper into it could be a traumatic event or past experiences. After all, we're a mix of different things. Um, but it, it, with a coach, it worked partner with you is encouraging and supporting you in that, in your journey to move forward. And the social worker is, is a different role, right? It's, it's more, um, it, it also assess what the needs of the participants are, but it, the different, it could be referrals into what they, their channels of support they are in the community. Um, um, and, and that is basically it's assess and evaluate what they need, where, where the conditions that the person have. I'm sure that um, it, with people disability, they need to assess, right? What do I need? Do I am able to function at home? Well, am I able to find what I need to survive to my day to day basis? So perhaps the roles are very distinctive from one to the other. Right. OK, yes, it's nice that you have the combination so you can talk about them all. <laughs> That's fantastic. I think when it comes to your own mental health journey, often when you're starting to assess that, there's a lot of uh, sort of outside chatter of, is this normal or is this something I should seek out help for? Can we talk a little bit about when it might be a good time to seek out a counselor or therapist and how you know when you're at a point where you could use some support, how somebody could maybe identify that for themselves? Kate or Ryan? I would, uh, I would say literally every single person could benefit from counseling. Um, we all live in a world where there's stressors, where there's challenges. I mean, just the fact that we live in a world where we have to navigate capitalism with uh, disabled bodies. Um, is reason enough, I think, to to um, to come to counseling. I mean, you know, as I think, I think anyone non disabled or non disabled should seek out support. I think it's it's really different than you know getting support from family and friends. Um, and then I would say, as as disabled folks, you know, we all have so much medical trauma that we've dealt with from dealing with the medical model of disability um and ab and ableism that yeah i i would invite like anyone to seek out support um and i think as disabled people too often pe we don't seek out support because we're so focused on our physical health um Challenge, like our physical health that we're dealing with, but mental and physical health are so intertwined. I know for myself, you know, when I am stressed, it is more likely that I'll have a flare up. When I'm stressed, it's more likely that my balance will be bad. When I'm stressed, like all of these things. And so getting support for, for that is so important. And I would say it's normal. It's normal to be you know, there's a quote, I don't remember, oh, I wish I knew off the top of my head who it was, but there's a quote that's like, being, um, 
being okay in a sick world is not okay, but being sick, being sick in this world that, or being, being unwell in a world that is already unwell makes total sense. Right. And so we are in a world that has various forms of oppression that has various for various stressors, et cetera. And so, you know, yeah, I would encourage everyone. I think that, you know, yeah, sooner the better. <laughs> That's what I would say. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to uh, harm you to further explore. Yeah. Ryan, did you want to add to that? Yeah. I just want to make a comment about the word normal. I think we should not use that anymore because like normal, I don't know, it's kind of pejorative term and what is normal anyways? Like serious, like when you say normal, like normal to what? Everyone's unique in that. It's like, I don't think I learned that in my school that we shouldn't use that word. It's kind of like a comparative word. Then we start using the word normal, non-normal. That's like, it's down that evilism path. And like, I just like to use the word natural. It's probably better. But I think like, especially for somebody with a disability, they're, this, they can't function because their mental health is so impaired, like they have very bad anxiety or this, they just can't function anymore. I really think they should seek out therapeutic help or mental health, go to a professional for mental health, like a counselor, a social worker. And yeah, what was I going to say? Yeah, but the only other problem is like access. How do they get access to the really sad thing about a lot of people with like health conditions or disabilities, they can't seek counsel's lack of appointment, employment, their like income assistance is very low. So it's very hard to, for them. So I think they should like finding agencies like mine that offer counseling at a low price of $40 an hour is like really, really helpful to, to find those agencies. It takes work, but and it's hard to find an mental health therapist as well, but I think it's worth the effort to keep trying and trying to find somebody who can work with you at the right price because the people's mental health is very important. It should be very important to them that they shouldn't just give up just because they face some obstacles of some therapist not wanting to work with them, but they should keep trying to find the one that would work with them because mental health affects your physical health like the one-to-one, -one, like it's... it's they're not two separate entities. Because if you have mental health is not doing well, their physical health condition gets worse. So just like keep fighting the good fight and find your mental health support person who's going to work with you. Absolutely. Yeah, all good points about access. And I do want to get into that. Mary Lou, did you want to add something before we kind of switch over to that? Uh, yes, you mentioned about when is a good time to contact uh, for help. I I would say any time is a good time to check in. What we normally tend to seek help is when we feel like it's a bit too much. Somehow our mind, our body tells us it's some, your struggle, it sounds so overwhelming. We need to trust that also every person is resilient. We are all resilient, but nobody is resilient at all times. So sometimes it feels like a bit too much. So if that is the case, you always try to reach out for support. We, I have in, in, in my work, a lot of people with disabilities, right? Whether it's a mental or physical, we do have all that spectrum. And it's still mental health, it pertains to the day-to-day -day basis. So we do work on what they could do um, and go from there. Yes, mental health is a day-to-day, -day, sometimes moment-to-moment -moment basis, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, there's a couple things that I wanted to touch on there. Um, how do we go about finding the right counselor? Maybe somebody has tried counseling before, gotten to the point of getting access, and it wasn't a fit for them. And a lot of people can become discouraged after that. So a couple of things here. How do you know when a counselor is a fit? Maybe how many sessions do you recommend going and giving it a try? And as a person living with a disability, do you think it's imperative to have a counselor with lived experience? 
whoever wants to take that first. I can um, maybe talk about this. So, um, you know, I think that, so one thing about having someone be a good fit is remembering that people can be a good fit for the time that you're seeing them. And then you can decide that they're not a good fit anymore. Right. And so like, it might be, you know, it might be you need to try it and then you realize, oh, this person, it's not a good fit right now for me. And I mean, I maybe Mary Lou or um, or Ryan has something to say about this, but I would give it like, I would give it like three to four sessions uh, to see. Um, and then in terms of w hoping that your, your therapist has a disability, um, this is something that I've been kind of pushing for and in the field is that a lot of people, therapists don't identify as having a disability, even if they do, they don't talk about it on their website. They don't talk about it in their, um, in their expertise, even if they do have a disability or an invisible disability. And this is because of you know, the lack of access in our, um, in our field, the lack of access in society in general, disability being seen as a bad thing still. Um, I think, you know, it would be amazing to find a, a, a therapist who has a disability, but that that's not the only thing, right? Like for myself, you know, I could find a therapist who has a disability, but doesn't know anything about queer and trans stuff. And that doesn't actually help at all for me. So I, you know, I could find a therapist who has a disability, but I don't like their mo modality. So it it's really about lots of different elements. So, you know, for me, it's really important to find a therapist that is social justice orientated and who has a deep knowledge of um, the body mind connection um, and uh, is more progressive. And, but, you know, yeah, it, it's possible that you can connect with someone who doesn't have the exact same identities as you. Yeah, that's my two cents. Absolutely. Maybe even making a list of some of the things that are really big priorities for you and, and then navigating whether or not other things can be passed aside at this point. Yeah. Ryan or Mary Lou, did you want to add to that at all? Yeah, like I just, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. Like I found one thing helpful when I was finding a counselor is to mention your health condition. And then based on the reaction, I decided who is the right one? I think I contacted 50 counselors and 48 of them said they wouldn't work with me just because of my disability. They said I have a lack of training or a lack of this and that. So then the two that said yes, they would take me on because I mentioned my health condition. I was very fortunate to find a counselor did have a disability. She didn't tell me that until the sixth session that she had a concussive disorder. Then it totally made sense why it was a good match because she had the right modality that I looked up. It's like, try to find people who have the right modality. Mention your health conditions so they reject you. You know, they're not a right fit from the beginning. Then just pick the one you like the modality and and they have a disability as well. Then that's a bonus, added bonus. But yeah, just being up for it and saying this is my health condition and they'll tell you right away their reaction, your gut feeling will tell you they're not the right fit for you. And just keep trying and trying because I had, to email 50 different people before I could get the counselor that was a good fit for me. So I really encourage people not to give up on that journey. Yes, it's difficult, but it's so important to keep fighting for your own mental health. Absolutely. And not thinking that counseling or therapy as a whole isn't for you because you haven't found the right person right off the bat. Yeah. Mary Lou? Well, I think the rapport that you build from the from the get go with with the therapist or the counselor is very key, and also the perspective from the patient, right? Whether they're really open and ready, because sometimes they think they're ready, or because they've been referred, but they're not quite ready yet, and that could be also a barrier when you work with them. Um, 
I, 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 it's amazing to, to see uh, Kate and Ryan, they're, they're working in their field when uh, embracing the disability and everything. I'm not sure if it has to be a person with disability, but that could be, I, I think I agree with Ryan that it's good that they mentioned the disability and, and to be able to understand the therapist. Um, but it doesn't need to be there because you what you need to embrace is the process that you're going to work with a therapist or counsel beyond whether they do share or they have a disability or not. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just, I would just, you know, I, I totally agree, Mary Lou, but you know, when a lot of people have gone through counseling programs or gone through social work programs that use the medical model of disability and are ableist, we, like as a disabled person, the amount of times that I've encountered a counselor who is ableist and, um, and I've had to, you know, navigate that and navigate either educating them or um, or deciding it's not a good fit or whatever. It's, it's like for, I, I think sometimes it's not just the process. It is about the fit. Like it is about, you know, are, do they have the knowledge to, you know, not be shocked when you say that you're, that you're doing counseling from bed, not be shocked when you've been in the hospital, um, you know, not be like, there's, there's things that, that I, we all have grown up in this ableist society. And so, you know, it takes, and social work school, schools and counseling schools might have a little bit um, of education around anti-oppression, but really not enough. Um, and so I would say like, it's, it's more than just the process. In fact, sometimes it's the connection is like more important than the modality as well. Yeah, maybe both and for sure. Okay, I just want to define modality. So modality is the process in which your therapist or counselor chooses to work. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. CBT, CBT or any other approaches. Well, okay. Approaches. Different types of approaches. Okay. And now, and also the word ableism has come up a bunch, which I expected it to, and it does, and it should. So let's talk a little bit about how ableism presents itself in the mental health world and how somebody might be able to navigate this if they're starting their journey and trying to find a counselor or some assistance. I know this is sort of Kate's specialty but but I'm sure I'm everyone has talking so much so I'm gonna like let other people if they if they well, Ryan do you want to start this one some of your personal yeah experience? I could start this one I think just from my education with the DSM-5 like there's some disorders that pathologize people with disabilities like adjustment disorder if you're having difficulty adjusting to a new diagnosis for six months if you get a mental health label and then there's illness anxiety disorder in the DSM-5 psychiatric illness if you worry about your health condition like it could be diabetes you're worried because you check your blood sugar that could be diagnosed with a mental health problem and then also I just really really hate uh, CBT it's extremely ableist it's like super medical model and I think if any therapist uses CBT with a disabled person they should not be practicing at all because it's so ableist Amen so you, to that. It's, and it's very like if directed like you do this, do that. I'm the boss. You do what I said. It's very doctor medical model. And I I don't like CBT in that way because it's totally related to DSF-5 is psychiatry, 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 which is very ableist and in every, <laughs> every way pretty much. But yeah, it's very difficult to navigate mental health and everything is this got this field of mental health is not needs to be fixed it's so broken right now just like the schooling there was no education about disability or anything like that try to debate with my director to change that but they're unwilling mm -hmm. to change that yeah it's just and I had to fight with the president of my school to get somebody to be the disability advisor 
to get funding properly. So just and being rejected by many therapists not want to work with me based disability. So there's lots of things wrong that need to be fixed. Like the modalities, there needs to be a lot more disability justice training, which is an offshoot of social justice, but it's way more it's ending all oppression for all people, mm -hmm. which I think is very important to work on. And it's like including it and I'm trying to educate people about that as well. That's my disability justice part is just trying to educate people with disability justice and how it fits in the field of counseling, which is so very important to know. Yeah, absolutely. Kate? Yeah, I thank you so much, Ryan, for saying that. I think I was like nervous to say that. But, you know, when we and I think that this is maybe the case for a lot of a lot of marginalized folks is that CBT can feel like um, all of a sudden oppression is the individual person's fault or not being able to deal with oppression is the individual's fault. Um, and I think, you know, mental health in general, the mental health field as a whole, you know, looks at looks at people's coping with the world as individual problems, which which is problematic because uh, because we are all dealing with like systems, right? And so when Ryan's talking about disability justice, I'm just going to do a mini education here. Um, disability justice was coined um, by Sins Invalid, which is a, a queer and trans BIPOC uh, group in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And they created the term disability justice to encompass how uh, disability rights and ableism are in, are interacting with other forms of oppression, such as race, class, um, all of these different types of things. There's 10 different principles of disability justice, um, really highlighting intersectionality and how the world um, is oppressive toward, toward disabled folks. So we talked a bit about ableism, but ableism is the um, is a type of oppression uh, and discrimination um, based on someone's disability or their perceived disability. So you might not be disabled, but you you could also face ableism. And one thing about ableism uh, that I think is really important to to talk about is that we all have bodies and minds. And so we all experience ableism because of how the how uh, how our bodies and minds will progress over our lifetime. You know, disability is is an issue that everyone needs to be involved in because we will all become disabled. You know, that that is like just the the we we will have an accident, we'll we will age, we will uh whatever right like disability is a part of humanity disability is a part of human diversity and so the need for the mental health field in particular and also every other field to be inclusive of disability is huge because disability you know one in five people are disabled and also our population is aging and so the more that we deal with ableism and internalized ableism, like the better the world will be for everyone, um, not just for disabled folks. I could like go on and on. I feel like I'm like on my, <laughs> uh, I just, I ha I don't even remember what the question was now, but, um, but yeah, I think we need to, um, yeah, I'm going to yeah. stop. Yeah, no, it's great. We, we clearly need more education for counselor, counselors and therapists in this area. And I think often able-bodied people don't think about aging into disability and that it is, that's a really good point, that it is a part inevitably of all of our lives. And do you know when disability justice, injustice was, was coined? That phrase? 2005, um, wow. it was coined in 2005, however, we can see the roots of uh, like that exact term was coined in 2005, but um, you know, disability justice went looking at intersectionality and looking at ableism um, 
in terms of race and class and all these other things has gone back, you know, back to like Harriet Tubman. Tubman. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, she was a black disabled woman fighting for social justice, right? And so, but disability justice was formed in response to the disability rights movement, which has historically been very white and focusing on physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. So disability justice um, came to focus on like a variety of disabilities, cross disability movement. Yeah. So yeah. 2005, it's not that long ago. Yeah. So, no. and if you want to put in the chat later, um, Sin Sins Invalid has a really good uh, resource online. And there's lots of resources online about the principles of disability justice. But I love what Ryan said, like, how do we bring these principles of disability justice into counseling, into the mental health field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, oh, that link didn't work. Okay, I will look at it since I'm valid. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, Mary Lou, anything to add? Uh, no, I just said, um, point out that normally uh, in, in, in practice, um, depression and anxiety uses a lot of CBT. So if we talk about specifically those two, at least those two topics is a lot of CBT. Um, and, and it's, uh, it, it's quite successful. And our clients that they, they do have some disabilities, they work well with, with the CBT approach. Um, so it might not work for everybody. That's like any other approach, um, but it's uh, normally used uh, for depression and anxiety at least. Do we want to talk about some other for some other modalities that like maybe perhaps Ryan that you prefer? Well, I see definitely work from a dis disability justice modality for sure. I think social justice. I think yeah, I also use a, a lot of narrative because like you're using conversations, like if your disability could talk, what would it say? Which can be a very powerful conversation with the client. Or if disability is sitting in the chair beside you, what would you want to say? It would be a very good way to vent their like frustrations. And I think really working from a grief and loss, well, maybe not a loss perspective, but like a grief perspective, because having a disability health condition is is a form of grief in my opinion, because the daily struggles and stuff you have to face, having medical trauma, like progressive illnesses, you have a bunch of grief and loss all the time. Like you're you're fine for months and months, and then you lost disability. You got weaker, and then you have to a lot of grief and loss is not recognized in the for people with disability or health conditions. Like it's swept under the rug because it's not fit the normal definition. But yeah, like just working from a grief and loss perspective, I think it really just like a humanistic as like social justice perspectives are really work well. So the client is the expert on their life and you're just there to support them on their journey down their mental health path. I'm learning so much about modalities. <laughs> I, awesome. I, I agree. I think, um, you know, a lot of time with basically all of my clients, we, we talk about grief um, and it's not just like, like grief, uh, becoming disabled, but it's like grief, you know, someone could have been born disabled and they still have the grief of like what it, seeing their peers do other things that they wish that they could do, like run a marathon or whatever. Right. I mean, I, ha I have that grief, that kind of grief all the time. I think we're told as disabled people that we have to be proud of our disability, but sometimes, sometimes it sucks. Right. Especially if you're dealing with pain and nausea or other like physical symptoms, not, not just like dealing with an inaccessible world. Um, I also, um, I, I do sometimes use DBT. Um, so dialectical behavioral therapy, and this, this looks at our, our emotions and emotional regulation as it relates to, um, to how we navigate the world. So, you know, um, and there's a really amazing book uh, that just came out or last year, it came out a year ago, um, created by a um, autistic uh, 
educator um, and uh, is called Neuro Neurodivergent Friendly DBT Skills Workbook. And um, basically, this person has taken out an entire section of DBT and replaced it with with sensory um, sensory uh, exercises, which is really great um, to make it neurodiv neurodivergent friendly. And I found it's also really good for people with disabilities as well. Um, and then I also have training in generative somatics, which is a type of somatic uh, work which, which looks at the mind-body connection. However, generative somatics is a more politicized view of uh, the mind-body connection. So it's not just our minds and bodies, but also how do our bodies interact with the world around us? Um, and I think too often disabled folks, what we do is, you know, we, because of medical trauma, because of how our bodies have been talked about um, throughout our lives, we, we start to disconnect from our bodies because that's a coping mechanism. And so generative somatics and somatics in general can be really uh, a wonderful, useful way to reconnect with our bodies and reconnect with the wisdom that our bodies are telling us. Because, you know, as humans, we have such good, amazing instincts around, you know, what, what different things are telling us. Um, but, you know, if, if the only time that your body has told you something has been in a medical setting or has been about pain or has been about nausea or whatever, then we start to disconnect from our bodies. So I think um, there's a lot of power in that kind of work, but it's hard work. It's really hard work, especially as disabled folks. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's hard work for, for everyone, but I could definitely see it adding another layer there. Uh, let's talk about some of the misconceptions that people have when it comes to mental health and disability. Mary Lou, maybe from some experience that you've you've had people in your program, what are sort of some of the, and this can be misconceptions as a person with a disability about what mental health should feel like. Perhaps there are a lot of people that think this is just what it is. There's no going up from here. So how do we sort of address some of those misconceptions? I, I think that it is perceived that they sometimes they they the things were not going to change. That's the 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 idea of any particular uh, in any any client whether they they have disability or not. I think the, the idea that what they're living right now nobody else have experienced, nobody will understand, and and things now might not change. Um, and they when they move from there, so. Uh, when, especially when there's some disabilities, it could be even undiagnosed uh, uh, illness, but they have the symptoms. Um, it's, it's debilitating and it, it's intrusive in their day and affects their day-to-day -day life. So we try to work in the idea that uh, the life is like a pie and you have pieces. The illness is, is how much of the illness, uh, uh, how much in your life the illness take, how many pieces of that pie like Kate is have different roles in their community. She's a, a therapist. She has a person with disability. She has this, this, all these compartments, right? So the illness is not who defined the person. The person is compounded of different things and abilities that they still can do. So when we focus on what really you wanna focus on the illness or the symptoms that you have, because sometimes there's some good days, right? And they're not so good days. So when we focus on when is that when we have a, an okay day or a great day, why would you like to focus on? And we took in the back, back burner a bit of it about the illness and focusing on what I'm able to do, I would like to do. Do more of certain things and stop doing some other things. So we focus on the participant and how can we move from there? Why we're willing to do, what can we do when we have an okay day, when you have no symptoms, when it feels like, okay, I woke up refreshed, or I was able to sleep last night, or I feel like I wake up, I can get out of my bed. So we work with the small successes because that's, that's what it counts. 
I do that kind of thing too, Mary Lou. I love it. I sometimes uh, one of the exercises I do with my clients is like, what what does a good day look for you? Look like for you? How do we talk about what a good day is? And then sometimes I I have some training um, in uh, anti psychiatry movement uh, program called RAP. It stands for Wellness Recovery Action Plan. And it's a peer-based mental health model. And it's you start with that. You start with uh, what's good. And then you start with, are there things I can do every day to make myself feel good? Are there things that I can, you know, when I'm having a bad day, can I look at my list? Oh, my list has pet a dog, go to nature, call a friend, right? And those are maybe like tiny, tiny little ways to start feeling better about yourself. Um, I think, yeah, and I think mental health can feel really overwhelming and you can feel like, well, I'm stuck here. And the idea is that like, we need to do really baby steps, right? The little baby steps are what make things better. And celebrating those small wins for sure. Ryan, anything to add there? Yeah, I think like one of the major misconceptions that is that people with disabilities can't be happy. Because like when I tell people I'm happy that I'm born this way, people are like, what? How is that possible? This can't be a thing. Even the research said that doctors are very confused when their clients with disabilities say, I was going to say, I'm happy. Because then feel the mental health with the psychiatry and medical model Supposedly, people with disabilities are not supposed to be happy, which I don't totally don't understand because most of my life have been pretty happy. There's some ups and downs and stuff like that. But majority of the time, I'm pretty happy. And most people with disabilities aren't miserable, sad people that are grieving every single second like the medical model assumes. Then also, like another thing I found quite interesting growing up when I found other research and stuff that people with disabilities talking about the illness makes people really uncomfortable like they don't have the right to share about that it's just very strange or you can't be grieving disability is not grief what is this like I've done lots of research and did a huge my master's project is all about ableism and all that stuff so it's like very interesting but yeah I'm <laughs> but whenever I do a, like an education like workshop or presentation with disability justice I intentionally play with that and totally flip it upside down and say that I'm happy, I have a great life, I wouldn't change anything. Like it's it's very fun to play with that during my educational workshop that I do. Yeah, it's like you send me an email if you want to do that for any event or anything that I love to educate you on disability justice. My presentation that I totally make fun of the idea of disability, how they people view it, like said, well, there's one show, Joe, there's one quote that I love from Jeffrey Pearson that's Preston that says, we're all to be human is to be disabled. And then he mentions how we're all limited in some way. He's and he's making a joke, said being bad at math could be a disability. Your arm is broken, it's a temporary disability. So I find that super interesting. The way he he totally jokes so he's like a comedian, his writing. Jeffrey Preston is it's very cool. He's a PhD professor in disability studies at I think Queen's University. His papers are very funny but very informative and I love his work, but yeah, he's clever. And I found, and I also found something interesting in our research that 40% of Canadians have a disability now as a result of COVID or something else now. So having a disability is not uncommon. If everybody has one at some point or going to have, so to get rid of the misconception is a disability and for disability could be anybody in a few years or if it is your neighbor pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was literally writing down disability justice workshop, Ryan. So <laughs> I will reach out for you. Yes, for that. I love doing them. Fantastic. I've done you already. I'm going to link this Jeffrey Preston's it's based, website. It's based on my master's project that this was just this educational workshop that I do. And Jeffrey Preston is, you know, to anyone should look up his work, he's it's hilarious, but it's very informative and very educational. Like, and I think another really good site for looking at journal thing is the Canadian 
was it Canadian Disability Studies Journal at Waterloo. Okay. He published in there too. There's, I know a lot of resources, but I could spend hours talking resources, but yeah. Yeah, resources are, are wonderful. We try and update our website as often as possible with resources. So if there's any that you'd like to share in an email with me, that would be fantastic. These always go by so quick. We have 10 minutes left. I do really want to quickly touch on because it came up Mary Lou was talking about some people don't necessarily have a diagnosis and there's some people with chronic illness all their life that go undiagnosed. So can we talk about diagnosis for a second and how that can play a major part in mental health? I would love to. Oh, okay. Mary Lou, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I do have, uh, participants who have, uh, a uh, series of symptoms um, that um, they've been for years, chronic pain, um, and they 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 prevent them from enjoying life or go to work or some days is it cannot get out of bed, they cannot move. Um, there is other uh, is for instance a conversion disorder is is very tricky also to to diagnose, but present a series of symptoms, sensorial things that could be disabilitating for a person. But so sometimes uh, the participant worries about and stress about and get anxious about not knowing whether there is will be a really, really bad and devastating situation for them, or it will be something momentarily. So we work with those participants that are presenting symptoms and not be quite diagnosed, but they're already creating so much anxiety or depression, right? So we focus on that. And, and they know that they work closely with professionals and doing evaluations and, and, and more um, referrals to the appropriate professionals to find out and give to the person at peace. But when you don't know, you just, your mind just keep wandering and agree, add to the anxiety. And therefore, as we know how connected our bodies are, our anxiety and low mood and depressions, as Kate was mentioning, sometimes exacerbates or enhance the symptoms that we already have. So we work on that because we do know that there is a close uh, link between those two. So there's a diagnose and an undiagnosed. We work with clients that have cancer and all kinds of disabilities, but also we work with the ones that they're not being diagnosed. They're already feeling and in the middle of finding out. So they, we work on what they're presenting now, whether it's low mood uh, depression or anxiety based on those symptoms. Okay, great. Yeah, Kate? Yeah, so this is uh, so real to me. Um, you know, I I first uh, was hospitalized, or I was in and out of the hospital in high school. It's been 20 years of uh, having symptoms that are progressively getting worse, and I still don't have a diagnosis. So, you know, I've seen geneticists, I've seen neurologists, I've seen everyone, right? And so we have to remember that, you know, diagnosis is only one part of our, of our disability journey. You can identify as disabled without having a diagnosis. In fact, the medical model and the medical system sometimes is quite limited in terms of knowing what a diagnosis is, what processes are happening in your body. And that doesn't mean that you need to, you know, be hopeless. Uh, I think, you know, a diagnosis, sure, a diagnosis can help you connect to community. It can help you have a name for something. It can help you discover treatment or whatever. But really, a diagnosis is just a label. And so, you know, if we're thinking about disability justice and we're thinking about cross-disability solidarity, diagnosis doesn't really matter. Um, and so I, like... I just want to inc in encourage people to, you know, identify with chronic illness or disability, regardless of diagnosis. I know for myself, you know, even though I don't have a diagnosis, when I started identifying as disabled um, more than 10 years ago, all of a sudden my life got better because I wasn't trying to explain it. I wasn't trying to search for something. I wasn't trying to hide it anymore. And so sometimes when we stop hiding or we stop trying to explain things, our lives can actually get better. And so, yeah, I just, I just want to encourage people like diagnosis is not, 
it's not the be all end all. And it's okay if you never have a diagnosis. It's okay if the diagnosis takes 20, 30 years. Um, it's okay if you decide, I need to stop searching for a diagnosis. It's not worth it. My mental health is uh, too bad right now because of medical trauma or because of whatever. Um, diagnosis is really, you know, our society is so focused on the medical model of disability, so focused on you need a doctor's note, you need paperwork from your from your doctor or whatever. But if we start looking and supporting people like as they are, then then we can really like start to change the world. And it it doesn't need to be this medical model. It's like it can be how do we support you? It can be how do we can create community with people who have you know, different bodily struggles or different struggles with our minds and bodies. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like based on these silos of diagnosis. So yeah, I'm, I feel very passionate about this particular topic as well. Absolutely. And also just changing the narrative that like, just believing somebody when they tell you that they're struggling or in pain, you don't need to have a name for it or visually have to see it. Yeah. And oftentimes medical doctors don't believe therapists don't believe these quote unquote professionals don't believe. And that's part of the problem, right? Is that, you know, we, we, there are, there's a whole list of diagnoses that are basically based on like, it's all in your head and that's actually really harmful. Right. And so we need to we need to start believing people regardless of the cause or regardless of what's going on. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I think that also circles back to that mind body connection and, you know, honoring your body and knowing that something is not right here and it's not up here. Cause that can be totally deteriorating for mental health. Like, is this all in my mind? No one can tell me what's going on. So I think allowing there to be room for that internal knowing. Ryan, really quick, do you have anything to add? What was the question? Just briefly, if you could tell me again. Yeah. Uh, Oh my gosh, what was the question? Oh, I was talking about diagnosis and how it can play a role um, on your mental health, whether or not you have one, et cetera. Yeah, I think having a diagnosis is a a double-edged sword. Like sometimes it connects with community and stuff like that. But then like when you go to the hospital, I can overhear people saying, oh, the DMD in room six instead of my name. Like it can be a good thing and a bad thing. Like your diagnosis now becomes a label that doctors can discriminate against you or facility or they treat you different. So you've got a, a, a medical a disability diagnosis on your chart and they, all medical professionals treat you differently all of a sudden. But the good thing about having a diagnosis is you can have a community now. So there's both good and bad of having a diagnosis or saying you're disabled because it can be accepting for some people and can be, other people can reject you based on that. So it's very interesting how it can be both a positive and a negative a diagnosis. Yeah, that you are not your diagnosis as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. It's okay if we just go a couple minutes over. I just want to leave people with the uh, sort of some steps that they can take in how to go about taking charge of their mental health, whether it's a resource in finding a counselor in the province that they're in, um, Mary Lou, if it's about how to do a self-referral in your program, can we just go down the line really quickly about some ways that people can get started on their journey? Okay, um, we also take the program for youth 13 and up, and that even counselors any school across, across BC can refer youth. Um, for uh, other ways, uh, your doctor, any doctor, any walk in clinic can refer you to our program. And also, self referral, just, just go to our site, uh, www.bouncebackbc.ca. And you go from there, navigate, and you can do a self-referral. You just need to put the name of your doctor. The admin person will do the follow-up, and then you will start um, uh, scheduling your sessions. Uh, What if you don't have a doctor? Uh, Walk-in clinic. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I just put the link in the chat. Kate? 
Um, so I'm going to speak more broadly. I think uh, mental health, uh, I, I would say like first start by connecting to community. There's so many amazing like online groups um, around uh, disability um, and other intersections. And so, you know, sometimes being disabled, it can be quite lonely and so and isolating. So, you know, really try to connect with community. Um, and then from there, you know, there's lots of different websites like um, affordable therapy websites. Um, there's always like Psychology Today, which is not my favorite, but it's an option. Uh, um, I have a pretty extensive wait list, unfortunately. Um, however, I am a, um, a EAP counselor through BC Housing. So if you work at BC Housing, um, you can get counseling from me. Um, but and if you want to join my wait list, um, right now I have a long wait list for individuals and a shorter wait list for couples. Um, and um, yeah. Great. Ryan? Well, if you look me up, well, I'm currently am accepting clients. Actually, I can work with anyone in BC at my Island Community Counseling Agency. I think you just look up Ryan Yellowlees on Psychology Today. There'll be a link to the website and you can email me directly at my my Island Community Counseling website. Yeah, I just got my wait. I don't have any wait list, so I could pretty much take on any client right now. And I think Psychology Today is a, an okay resource for people to look up, like a counselor in the area, because they can look up the modalities, are they disability justice oriented? Are they work with chronic illness? You can, like, it's a very good resource to use. You can check their pricing, stuff like that. And I think also the, the BCACC or the website that gives accreditation or, or it gives accreditation to BC Council is a good resource for BC. So look up things. I think whatever the licensing agency in that province that normally has a database of all registered therapists, you can check the options that you want, male, female, whatever, like this using those databases is quite useful to find the person. Then you start emailing people like I did, then you find your right fit by working through that. Because normally the, each registered province where a registered therapist identifies with that organization, there's like a website. For me, it'd be BCACC for a licensed therapist, but yeah. Start looking up online and just checking all the checkbox that you want and then have a conversation and see if it's the right setup for you. Fantastic. I think it's really great that community was mentioned as well. I think a lot of times it is a very lonely journey. And so reaching out to a friend and if you don't feel like you have somebody you can reach out to in, in your life, joining an online community, um, support groups. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. This was a ton of great information. I have copied the chat, so I will kind of go through the resources listed and we'll add them to our website. And uh, I will also email the panelists right now with the YouTube link that uh, this was live broadcasted too, and it will live up there so you can share with your community as a resource. And again, just thank you for the work that you do and for being a part of our perspective series on navigating mental health. I'd also love to reach out to you individually about some ways that we can work together in the future. For sure. Thank you yeah. for the invite. Thank you, Ryan and, and Kate. Uh, great work that you guys do. And thank you, Emily, for the invitation again. Nice to see you again, Mary Lou. Yeah, thank you. And I'd be happy to connect as well, uh, Ryan. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really I would, I want to connect with you because I have some questions about how I can increase my knowledge about disability therapy and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Great. should have each other's emails from the yes yeah okay great awesome and i think we should have another series like this i think it's just just one is not enough like there should be like a a series of disability and mental health like yeah i absolutely three, three or more or something like that so we do so these... much i want to share but i can't get it all in one hour it's just not enough time we do bigger events than this called accessible community forums we actually did our first one in person, but they have like 
75 to 150 attendants. And it's a two, two to three hour discussion with a panel. And we put out a survey in advance. And I absolutely think we should do one on navigating mental health. So perhaps we'll look into that for our one in October. And I will absolutely reach out to you all again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Causer. Thanks for running the session. I have copied the chat, so I will. Yes. Okay.